I think we are live. Welcome everybody. This is uh, Mikolai Sekutovic uh, speaking from uh, Kama Art. Um, I want to welcome everybody um, uh, that is now uh, in the audience here to uh, our second uh, conversation uh, in partnership with the British Council. I want to very warm welcome uh, Severa Davis um, and all our panelists uh, to this talk. Before we start and before I will give um, the word to Severa, um, I want to introduce the Wellbeing Culture Forum. The Wellbeing Culture Forum is um, a format that we have um, that we have created as response to COVID-19. We started it already in March with private sessions and then we expanded uh, with um, our different partners uh, into the public through Zoom. Um, uh, we started with a talk uh, about art in architecture together with Hans Ulrich Obris and the Serpentine Gallery and uh, then we had um, a talk in cooperation with the Manchester International Festival co-moderated uh, uh, by Mark Spiegler from Art Basel. And then the last talk was um, uh, about the social culture of cities together with the British Council. Um, and now this talk will highlight the question of uh, architecture for health and happiness. Um, I learned in the past months more probably um, about one of our core elements of our business, what is architecture and infrastructure than ever. I learned that uh, there is an invisible element to our lives uh, that we can't see. And uh, because we cannot see it, it's very often also overseen um, in design, in architecture, in infrastructure, in city planning. This element has a lot to do with empathy. It has a lot to do with uh, human relationships, but it has also a lot to do with our relationship to our environment, to plants, to other biological organisms like animals. Uh, all of them are connected to an invisible population of bacteria. Um, we usually, when we design, we don't design for bacteria, but uh, what we learned through COVID-19 is that uh, bacteria is not only constituting 40% of our non-human cells that everybody is carrying around in its body, but it's also has a profound, um, profound um, uh, effect on our health, on our mental health, on our happiness. And actually we need bacteria and we need um, the permanent um, connection to uh, the bacteria of our environment to be healthy and happy. Um, so we basically, to have a world that is healthy and happy, we need to be connected uh, with, uh, with the environment that we usually exclude from our, from our uh, environment. And uh, this is a problem uh, that we want to highlight here um, uh, with uh, panelists that all work already in their fields uh, um, very far ahead, I would say on the forefront of, of, of this new form of design. It is not only a human-centric design, but this is a design that because it takes care for the human includes also the uh, other parts of, of our world. I want to say a big thank you also to the Design Magazine that is, um, that is a partner now for the fourth consecutive time um, of these talks. And uh, we are also a partner of the extended uh, virtual design festival of Design. So we are very, very happy to have them as partners and um, yeah. And I want to thank the British Council again. Um, uh, we started the cooperation, the partnership with the British Council during the architectural biennial um, um, that uh, had the free space as motto, how to design free space, how to create free space. And since then we are now in the third consecutive year of our partnership. The last year was the partnership for the beautiful exhibition of Kathy Wilkes. And uh, now um, also this is, I think, like the sixth talk that we're doing together. And we are very, very happy about this. And um, I would like to, I would like to uh, give the word now to Severa Davis, my co-moderator, and uh, ask you to introduce our panelists. Uh, great. So 
Firstly, um, thank you, Mikolai, for opening tonight's event and a very big um, welcome to everyone joining us. Um, I think we have hundreds, if not thousands of you joining from all around the world. So uh, thank you for, for being with us on this evening um, to explore well-being and health and happiness in our cities today. I think we can all agree um, there's never been a more important moment to talk about this. So. Um, while I have the floor, as it were, um, just say a few words. So um, I'm Severa Davis, Director of Architecture, Design and Fashion at the British Council, which also bestows upon me the honor of being the commissioner of the British Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale. So very quickly, for those who may not know, the British Council is the UK's international organization for cultural relations and educational opportunities. If I could have the next, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, so, the British Council um, aims to create friendly knowledge and understanding between the people of the UK and other countries. Our work is centered around arts and culture, education, and language. The British Pavilion at the Venice Biennale is one of the British Council's flagship cultural relations initiatives. And so, I just like to take this opportunity, as Nikolai alluded to. Um, to thank Therme for their support, not only of tonight's event, um, the second collaboration with the British Council, but also for Therme's continuing partnership to support the uh, British Council's Venice program. So the, the current global pandemic has delayed the 2020 Architecture Biennale to 2021, uh, but we're looking forward to an ambitious and topical exhibition in 2021. If I could have the slide with the uh, Garden of Privatized Delights, please. Um, so the, the 2021 British Pavilion um, will invite us to engage in the debate around the privatization of public space in Britain today through an exhibition titled The Garden of Privatized Delights. From the pub to the playground, uh, common land to the garden square, the high street to facial recognition technologies, the curators of the pavilion, Manajay Verghese and Madeleine Kessler, are working with a team of five architects, designers, and researchers to highlight the threats to public space today. The exhibition aims to propose new ideas for ownership and greater access and to demonstrate the role that design and architecture can play in a more inclusive future. I think we can all agree that the issues of public space and who gets a say in how they're designed, developed and used are more topical than ever. So we're looking forward to the British Pavilion in 2021, but no doubt um, a robust discussion that will touch on some of these issues tonight. So moving on to our panelists, we have an amazing seven panelists and a rich discussion ahead. Um, so we're going to get right into it. Um, just so everyone knows, knows who's who and if it's not too, um, to Corny, I think I'll just uh, name you and if you can give a little, little wave when I mention your name. Um, so first of all, we have Maria Adebavale Schwarte. Hi, Maria, welcome. Hello. Uh, we have Jaden Ali uh, with a very cool background. Um, How are you doing? Ben Arnold. <laughs> Hi, nice to see you. Matt Gilchrist. Hello. Sean Griffiths. Oliver Heath. Hi. And Carolyn Steele. Hiya. So um, we are so pleased to have all of you here with us tonight. Um, and thank you for sharing your expertise and insights with us. So we're going to start with a sort of by way of, um, because we haven't read out your very illustrious biographies, um, but uh, we thought we'd get right into the discussion. So um, tonight we're talking about the architectures of health and happiness in, in the city today. Um, and so I'd like to start with a question um, and ask you to introduce yourselves in answering that question and refer to the work that you've done in the past. Um, and that question is how you think about happiness in relation to your own work and your own practice. And Mac, I'm gonna start with you. Hello, um, well, I'm Matt Gilchrist. I'm the founding director and curator of the Edible Bus Stop. Um, we are a landscape and urban design collective that adopt quite a multidisciplinary approach to our project. Um, we create planted installations in permanent and temporary settings in the urban realm. Our aim is to enhance the public realm through increasing biodiversity, creating accessible sites that are inclusive, 
and, and create a dialogue with the general public through community engagements and opportunities to be part of the schemes and foster uh, conversations surrounding social responsibility and environmental issues in the city. Um, I personally take particular joy and get great happiness by being uh, offered opportunities to take very desolate sites. And um, I find the transformation therefore is far more uh, is far, far more impactful. I think you have a slide that I can I can um, give as an example of our work here. So um, there we go. So you'll see at the top uh, left of there that is um, actually how a particular site, one of our our first garden, the original edible bus stop, um, it was particularly desolate site and completely forlorn. But it was going to get sold. To, uh, from the public realm into private, and there would have been the loss of a lovely, beautiful, uh, mature silver maple tree. Um, and um, I kind of took it upon myself to man the neighborhood <laughs> to get, get down there and get digging, because if you don't use it, you will lose it. And this was back in uh, 2011. And through getting the community interested and getting having them having a, sort of an invested interest in that site, because once you've got dirt under people's nails, they have a vested interest in that site. The conversators started turning around to what could we do with this? And then there was a design competition. We collaborated with that. And eventually I found some funding. And what you'll see, you'll see the community in the bottom left of that, that's them digging. And then finally, um, we transformed that with funding and it's now known as the Curb Garden. It is completely run, uh, self-sustained by local dedicated volunteers to this day. The picture you see there is um, after the first year of it being planted, that's how much growth happened in one year. So already what we've done there is we've cut, we've, we're, we're coming at it from sort of a three-pronged approach. There's the social aspect. So now we've provided a spot that the community can be proud of and that they've got a place to gather at and that they can get involved with by gardening there and donating plants. Um, it's opposite a mental health hospital. So staff and patients alike will come and sit there. We've got the environmental benefits. Well, evidently, you know, the uh, biodiversity has been greatly increased by the planting there. And of course the rain, uh, the water runoff, all those elements that we've added to that site. And then, of course, you've got this, the, the very important sort of the, the, the economic level, which is just it just encourages people to, to dwell. And, and the, the cafes and the shops locally are getting more trade because this is now a place that people want to be. So I find that the reason also that I've always encouraged from the get go that people plant edibles is that edibles create conversations. And that is because it's the great common denominator between all of us, we all eat. So if you plant an edible, you're, you're far more likely to have a conversation. And this was recently illustrated in a garden that I curated in Brixton where I'd gone along and I'd noticed there was woolly aphids and I was brushing them off and spraying them with my natural spray. And a gentleman who was sat there asked me if I was from the council. And I said, no, I'm just someone cares about the tree. And then this beautiful conversation then came that he was, yes, me too. And during the really quiet days of lockdown, I didn't like to leave my flat too far, but I would come and sit and watch those blossoms. And I'm really looking forward to the fruit. And to me, that, that was everything. That is why I get up in the morning is that that's people caring about it, people having solace from it, finding there's so many layers of, of wonderfulness there. That's, that's why I do what I do. Thank you so oh. much, Mac, um, for, for opening it up with that and also just sharing that, I think, that story at the end um, and, and that important note around the importance of creating a conversation and connection between people. Um, Maria, can I come to you next with the, the same question, sort of thinking about happiness in relation to your work? Yeah, well, um, I'm the CEO of the Foundation for Future London, and that's an independent charity. And um, we're working to create and support the well-being of all local communities in East Bank with our East Bank partners, Waltham Forest, Tell Hamlets, Hackney and Ewan. And the whole idea about it is expanding grant opportunities and disrupting the way that um, an organisation provides grants. We're very much about partnership and facilitating, but what we're trying to do is create a place which supports 
economic and social value. And the big piece of that is well-being. And that very much fits with my kind of thinking through my career is that to be disruptive and to always ask for social and economic value and inclusion. And the foundation is very much about that. It's about working with partners to facilitate creative placemaking and local places. And our vision is about a vibrant and inclusive East Bank with the four communities, um, which is creative engagement um, and creative co-design because I feel that we've got to a place where we might have some wonderful, beautiful spaces, but how inclusive are they? Whose economic value, who gets the economic value of some of these spaces? And, and, and also a question about actually who are the architects and who are the planners? Now, I put my hand up a little bit to that. My career started off in environmental justice, environmental law, um, and before that, organisation studies. And I wanted to know how you could use organisations as a way, as a catalyst for change. Um, and also this, the thinking around actually the environment is about um, the natural environment, but it's also about how does that impact on people as individuals and within cities. Um, and so that's always been, I guess, quite a big part of my career has been around well-being. Where does it start? Making sure that it's kicked, um, kicked off with equity, empathy, equality and compassion for people. And I think if you were to show my photograph, um, it's pretty much about that, the image that I, that I sent. Um, I don't know if that's possible now, but it's really about co-design places and healthy creative learning and innovation. Can we see the image to our team? Yeah. That's it. So I took that photograph actually in Adelaide. Now it doesn't necessarily speak for the area that it was in, but it struck me that's the most simple way of talking about well-being and inclusive places, because that's what it's about. It's about co-design and thinking about others and ourselves, a place for you and you and you and you into infinity, because it's about everyone. That's when we get well-being cities. Yeah, I think this is uh, extremely important argument uh, and an extremely important word, even co-design, that we are not always uh, just commissioning a big architect or big designer to do a big uh, uh, design, but uh, it's about sharing and it's also about ownership. I think a lot of the things that we are seeing now uh, worldwide, especially in the United States, are about co-ownership. People are not owning their city anymore. They are basically completely uh, social alienated from their city, from their direct neighborhood. And it's quite interesting because if you see children in any culture to draw their home, it's always a home that is individual. It's always something where they actually have an influence on the facade. They can paint the facade of the home. They can make a tree. They have a garden around it. So this is something that is very close to us. Our home is a kind of extension of our own bodies. And uh, this is taken away completely. And I think exactly what, what you mentioned is a crucial uh, element of this. I wanted to um, now introduce Ken Arnold, the creative director of the Welcome Collection and professor at the Copenhagen University. And Ken, I wanted to ask you, what is it that makes uh, you happy in your work and how your work makes, uh, makes others happy? Uh Thank you very much, Nikolai. Um, yeah, I guess what makes me happy in the two cities I live in is the variety and the awe-inspiring diversity. Uh, so that's, you know, diversity of people, diversity of buildings, diversity of stories, diversities of, of views. Uh, and, and I think, you know, that's what is magnified in cities, that sense in which so much is brought into them. So from that, I guess, where I get my happiness and where I try and play it out through my work is the sort of increased uh, sense of curiosity, uh, the increased opportunity for contemplation. And then I guess, you know, because everything has to be three and now I've used two C's, so my third C's. Uh, so being curious about things, finding out more about them, dwelling, you know, we all live in such rapid, uh, overloaded lives, so some place that we can actually just contemplate and then make unusual connections. So, and in terms of my work and, and the organization that I'm with, um, I, I work at Welcome, um, and actually that might be a slightly confusing picture to be showing. Um, there's a <laughs> 
uh, that looks a wonderful project and I'm dying to find out about it. But my work at Welcome, we're, um, we're an organization that uh, is uh, a medical and health foundation. So of course, at the moment, we're 90% we're focused on uh, the health uh, of the world that we're all trying to think through uh, and very much involved in, in funding vaccine activity and um, hopeful cures for, for COVID. But Welcome is also a very broad organization. So we're also heavily involved in culture and in the arts, and that's my side of things. And what I do there is um, very much work on international cultural projects. Uh, so in fact, if, if there is uh, an opportunity to share the slide that I sent along, it uh, comes from a project that ironically, I just finished at the end of last year, and it was called Contagious Cities. Um, when we started this project three or four years ago, the idea of epidemic preparedness was a, a complicated, slightly obscure notion that we had to spend a bit of time telling people we thought was really important. And of course, history has overtaken us. Um, so this was a project in Hong Kong, in New York, uh, in Geneva, in Berlin. And our idea was to co-produce exhibitions, live events, uh, artist residencies, broadcasts with partners and colleagues that we found in each of those cities who were interested both in thinking about this core issue of how have diseases affected cities and how have cities affected diseases. Also, how can we share the insight of people with lived experience? of people who have an artistic uh, temperament, of people who are very involved in research, both humanities and, and uh, of course, science and health research. How can we share those insights brought together crucially in the context of a city and work with local partners in museums, in broadcast stations, uh, artist residencies to develop projects that explore what then seemed like an important but slightly dis distant topic Topic, and now feels like it's the topic that's highest on all of our minds. Um, and actually, I'm now just moving on to a new project uh, to do with mental health called Mindscapes, which will use similar methodology to explore what mental health means in Tokyo, in Bengaluru, in Berlin, and in New York. And thank you very much um, uh, for this uh, introduction. It's extremely interesting how you connect culture and health. This is something that was also the driving motivation behind our company's Therma Art Program when we found it in 2017. It was because we saw that only cultural adaptation can actually solve the problems that culture caused worldwide. Environment is a big topic of it, but also the health of our population, obviously. Um, and uh, culture is at the end always determining what we are eating, when we are eating, how we are eating, how we are spending our our time and how uh, and how uh, healthy we are. And this leads me uh, to our next panelist, um, that uh, is Carolyn Steele, the author of uh, Hungry City. Um, and this is also something that is related very close to culture. We now, uh, I think last week, uh, we had this new study coming out uh, or re referred to that we have uh, but a poor diet can uh, is, is actually one of the biggest uh, triggers for uh, for deaths. Um, uh, over 11 million people per year can be accounted uh, directly um, uh, because of a poor diet, and uh, and it's not only um, uh, this ultima uh, uh, ratio here, but it's also our well-being, our happiness, uh, it's extremely connected uh, to the food supply chain. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Caroline, how um, your work uh, is able, in your opinion, to make the world uh, more safe and more healthy and more happy place. Well, thank you very much, Nikolai. I mean, yes, indeed, I, I'm an architect who kind of um, escaped um, <laughs> into the world of food, and that makes me happy every day. Uh, because my great discovery has been that people who understand food get life as well, because food is life. Um, and I often say that, you know, food consists of living things that we kill so we can live. Um, and that just gives you some idea of how weird it is that we've come to think of food as something that can be cheap. Um, I got, how did I get into this? It's a long story and we only have a few minutes, but just to say, yes, indeed, I wrote a book called Hungry City that came out 12 years ago. Uh, and I'm just showing it to you live because I didn't send you an image of it. 
Um, and in that book, I just asked the question of how do you feed a city, basically. Um, and it seemed like a really a sort of basic question to ask. And it was kind of weird to me that I was the person asking this question. But I got into food because I, I found the sort of discourse. I mean, I've always been really interested in cities. I was born and bred in central London. Uh, I love cities, but, but you know, the architectural discourse around cities often focuses on things like kind of traffic flow and public space and if you like slightly abstract things and I just thought that cities are so much more than this so the idea of writing about a city through the lens of food um, just came to me actually 20 years ago now and it's the moment that changed my life because I've never as it were really gone back to the day job um, and I now see the world through the lens of food um, and actually a few years ago, I, I, I mean, this is a slightly smartened up version, but I did a drawing where I was trying to work out where food sits in our life. And I just do a plate of food, people sitting around a table, sharing, connecting, a cook figure, a market, which becomes the economy, a city where the market sits, a countryside where the city sits, nature where it kind of all sits, and then the universe. Um, and I kind of drew a section through that drawing and that became this book which is called Zootopia, How Food Can Save the World. Um, wow. And the reason, and that came out the, the, the same week that the global pandemic was declared, which was interesting. Um, but essentially I believe food can save the world because as I say, there's no such thing as cheap food, but if we reinvest the true value in food, everything that we do in life is shaped by the way we eat. As you said in your introduction, the microbiome in our bodies is directly connected to the natural world where our food comes from. But also food is what profoundly connects us to one another. I don't know about you, but if I have friends over, I feed them. Um, you know, feeding people is maybe the most, you know, the, the best expression of love we can show people. But of course, food also connects us to the natural world. So it's, it's deeply embedded in our uh, most important sets of relationships. And I think, you know, if you ask the question, how are we going to live in future? You can do it really, really powerfully by asking the question of how are we going to eat in future? So it's about valuing food and using food as a lens. And I should have explained the word Zootopia means food place. And it's a word I invented and it's a food based sort of real practical alternative to utopia, which can't exist. Whereas we already live in a Zootopia, a world shaped by food, but we live in a bad one because we don't value food. But if we did value food, we could build a much better one. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much, uh, Carolyn. Um, I, I cut you off, Nikolai, but I'm, in, I'm going to, um, that, was, that was fascinating. And actually, I, I think we all were mesmerized by your, by your drawing there. And I think this, this link between food and cultures and, and culture, I should say, and how we live um, is so important. And that brings me to uh, Jaden. So Jaden Ali is the founder director of JA Projects. And I think um, in, in what I know of your work, Jaden, a, a lot of it is about sort of this intersection between um, architecture and culture and infrastructure and, and how they all um, collide and hopefully are um, complement each other. So could we ask you the same question? Introduce yourself and your work um, and, and not forgetting this important word of happiness. For sure. Um, and it's, it might be a bit echoey in here. The acoustics are a, a bit strange, but um, it's so nice to just share, a, share an agenda because I think there's so much overlap between what's been said by Marie, Mac and Carolyn. I suppose I'm, I'm the founder of JA Projects. We work at this intersection of architecture, urban strategy, art and performance. Um, but I also kind of co-lead the MArch course at Central St. Martins. And I think that's important to note because our work is cultural and is, uh, it com comprises built elements, but it's also a kind of form of research. And I think that's where architecture is at its best in kind of projecting an, an alternative future. In, in general, our projects strike a balance between playful precision, where a, where a cultural, often ephemeral, social and performative component is twinned alongside a physical built component. And for us, both, both parts are, are important. Both parts are necessary in order to test, the, and test that kind of cultural, that cultural construction as a form of research, but also to, to make kind of resilient and sustainable interventions that empower people and make a, a positive contribution to the surrounding context. Um, I suppose our work can be defined as sitting somewhere between immaterial constructions, 
and material construction is possibly something that I'll come back to uh, a little later on in, in the conversation. But effectively, the cultural component is, is the form of advocacy and research. And that's the translation of that cultural component into something um, more material is, is the kind of, is us in part in, um, is where, where our practice sits. And really, it's about testing how we can make others happy. And that brings us a sense, a sense of joy. Um, in re really, the way we see happiness is about, especially with regards to the city, is about belonging. It's about engendering a sense of home. It's about constructing a sense of ownership, all of which has been mentioned before. But in doing that, it's also about how you see, how one sees themselves in, in the city. And therefore, I think kind of representation is, is difficult. Architecture is not great at speaking to and for those on the margins. And um, I'm going to segue into this image in, in just a sec section, but in just a, in, in just a moment. But recently, after the death of George Floyd, um, the, the, the question that's been at the forefront of my mind and is bringing me the most amount of joy, if that can be the correct term, most amount of happiness, is how to make black architecture with the power, beauty, and alienation of black cinema. And, and with that said, these are a set of stills that, um, that, that are taken from a cinematic work um, that we produced as our submission for the British Pavilion. Um, won't hold it against you, Severa. I don't think you was around at, at the time, but it was our, our collaborative proposal alongside Priya Kanchandani of Icon and the Design Museum and Joseph Henry of the Greater London Authority. And effectively, the, the, the call for the British Pavilion called for submissions that address architecture's most urgent issues. And therefore, we reimagined the neoclassical, neoclassical British Pavilion as a house for Britain, this grand dwelling that, feel, that was filled with the eclectic curiosities of a diverse profession and nation. And just in terms of reference uh, and relevance to the, the winning proposal, it very much was, was, and we do share a concern for public space. In this image, um, you can see that the, a visitor, this just conveyed the experience of a visitor to the pavilion where they were superimposed onto backdrops of our most civic spaces. That's Ridley Road Market in the top right. Um, where they're, where they're kind of enlarged into kind of these grand civic projects, such as kind of the Rio Cinema that, that, that performs a, a really essential, um, a really essential kind of task within, within society. And so as much of the civic spaces that we projected in the pavilion, um, and we chose them to be the hall and the chapel and the conservatory and the long gallery, um, we wanted to project and canonize the people who might attend this space to shift the focus somewhat. And the proposal was effectively a, a call for British architecture to be more inclusive towards a diversifying world. And, uh, and I suppose it's a cultural, and, and, it, and it was, the hope was that it would become a cultural and immaterial foundation upon which to base our more material constructions. And that's really, that's really where we're, we're happiest, sitting somewhere between that, in, that intersection between immateriality and materiality and research. Thank you so much, um, Jaden, for sharing that. And I think um, a really striking image. And I think we're all, particularly after the murder of George Floyd and the situation that we find ourselves in, thinking about how we, um, how we can, how everything can be more inclusive. Going back to Maria's, um, her image around a place, a place for you and you and you, and a really a place for everyone. And um, some of the terms that have been coming up a lot, I think, in, um, in addition to inclusivity, in the current situation we find ourselves in, um, another term is resilience. And that's where I think that term has lots of meanings and it means something different to lots of people. Um, and I think we'll come on to it um, momentarily, but I think I'm going to use that as an opportunity to come to you, Oliver, because you're a, a biophilic designer. And I have a feeling that you probably have something to say on this on this topic of resilience and what we can learn um, from and with nature. So over to you to introduce yourself. Okay, thank you. So my name is Oliver Heath. I am founder of Oliver Heath Design. Um, we work in the field of architecture and interior design. And we're slightly unusual as a design company in that we are both researchers and analysts 
Uh, so we write a series of white papers and uh, different documents um, where we collate information about health and well-being in the built environment, but we're also designers. So in part, it's about how we implement those research studies into three-dimensional forms. As well as that, I spend a lot of my time teaching arch architects about health and well-being and this new emerging uh, subject called biophilic design. Um, so essentially, um, my work has always focused around sustainability. Um, and over the last eight years, I have focused more particularly um, on the more human centered aspects of that, as opposed to the traditional carbon centered conversation. So this human centered conversation is really around uh, health and well-being. And in particular, we're focusing on this area of biophilia. So biophilia means a love of nature. That's a term that's been around since the 1980s. But essentially, it's an evolutionary design ethos that suggests that we all have an innate uh, attraction to be in and around nature and natural processes. And when we're near nature, it has this incredible deep effect on us. It has um, the ability to uh, reduce stress and heart rates and blood pressure, but also to help us to recuperate. Um, and as well as that, to help us connect with one another and also the places that we find ourselves in. Now, our approach to architecture and design um, it's slightly unusual. I think, you know, on the whole, something like interior design often has a bit of a bad rap because it's very often uh, a medium for expressing identity. And, and quite often, you know, it, it's an additional layer to lavish on top of a piece of uh, architecture that might express power or wealth or identity. So it's a very extrinsic approach. Our approach is quite different in that it's what we call intrinsic and it investigates how people feel when we're in this space. So it, it looks at how we can deliver the intended function of that space, whether it's to work or to learn or to, uh, to recuperate um, or to rest and relax. And, and it looks at how we can actually create spaces that deliver on those intended functions by introducing elements of nature. So biophilic design is kind of much more than just adding you know, plants and greenery. It, it's really this human-centered approach that looks at how we make people feel better in the spaces that are so important in our lives. Now, when we talk about happiness, um, there's a really particular study that we always go back to, which is called the Harvard Grant Study, which was a 76-year-long study undertaken at Harvard University. And what they did is they studied a, a, a test group uh, over 76 years to ask them what were the things, the key drivers that led to human happiness. And what they found was that the, 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 the key fundamental approach to delivering happiness is the formation of strong bonds with friends and with family and the people around you. So we then interpret these ideas about, well, how do we bring people together? We feel that we need to find you know, a universal connector between people. Uh, and it's interesting that we have, uh, Carolyn's already talked about food as being that. In our world uh, of biophilic design, we believe that um, everybody at some point has had a positive experience of nature. So we use that as the medium in which to bring people together to create kind of unifying experiences that can then facilitate um, conversations. Because when we're in nature, it makes us feel more relaxed, more calm more open, positive and optimistic. And as a result, when we're in that state of mind, we're more likely to share a conversation around a shared experience of nature. So we use nature as the catalyst to bring people together, to improve their experiences of spaces um, and to create more resilient spaces as well. Because when we see nature in its, in its most organic, natural form, you know, if you were to see a forest with lots of different species of plants, you'd understand that that has the resilience to resist infection or disease. Because if one species was to die out, then another would pop up in its place. And we believe that people are quite similar, that when we step into a space or into a city, we need to understand that there are different places for us to inhabit, places where we can rest and relax, to energize, to stimulate, connect. And we need that diversity of spaces. So. Uh, much as Ken mentioned, this idea of diversity um, is, is really, really important in order to make people feel comfortable and relaxed. And that those spaces should have clear identities so that people understand how they can be used. And we believe that nature is the catalyst that makes so much of that happen. Yeah, thank you so, so much, Oliver. Uh, you uh, mentioned basically, you, you ticked all the boxes that for us are extremely important. Uh, that diversity uh, is one of them. 
Um, resilience through diversity is also one of them. And I also think that the diversity um, has to exist on all levels. We are maybe just not able to see our position in history, you know, coming from this, coming from this um, uh, thousands of years of uh, evolution where our bodies were formed. We are only uh, uh, a very short time so much disconnected from nature as we are now. And uh, COVID-19, as we all know, wouldn't be possible with the monocultures that we have created all over the world. Yeah, Because basically we decide on our plate how the world and the landscapes of the world is shaped. And uh, the, uh, the agriculture here plays a big role invading basically wildlife and allowing this uh, this uh, viruses uh, from wildlife jumping into our human systems and then meeting basically a monoculture of human bodies because we created a monoculture of ourselves basically in cities disconnected from from the usual diversity of nature that our bodies were, were formed in and this is why I'm so happy that Sean Griffiths, um, Professor Emeritus from the Chinese University in Hong Kong, is here with us uh, as a specialist of epidemiology. And uh, I, I would like uh, to, uh, to introduce you, uh, to ask you to introduce yourself and also with the question how your work can be connected to health obviously, and to happiness in, in, in the way that we are interested in. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me today. I come from a slightly different world. I come a physician, and uh, um, and I used to work in Hong Kong, and I just wonder if I could have my first Hong Kong picture, the red one, up, because uh, the one thing about Hong Kong is that uh, it's obviously a very crowded place. Um, it has the highest population density. I, there's, that's fine, just leave the four images there because you'll see the, the, the pictures of Hong Kong. Um, the, pic, the red picture was, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is from, uh, it was actually taken, I have a photograph I took um, during the occupation uh, in uh, 2014 by the uh, students with the Yellow Umbrella Movement. And that was all about, uh, apart from the politics, it was all about seeking a better life. Um, the, the picture of Maron Shan shows you another view of Hong Kong, a view of Hong Kong with space. Because what I wanted to do was to think about from a public health perspective, we think about populations. And when we think about uh, health is happiness or happiness is health and health and wealth are interrelated. And it's about interrelationships between individuals and their environment. So environment is hugely important for health and for public health. And there's been increasing, uh, in, increasing interest in environment and health uh, in terms of positive place to be, as opposed to just, this is the environment in which germs grow. I mean, people know the story of Jon Snow and the pump in uh, London, the pump handle, the, the but polluted water, the understanding of cholera, all those sort of historical understandings, all the infectious diseases we've seen. And if so, you have to place individuals in their, in their environments. And if you place individuals in their environments, I was thinking, what, what, what's important to an individual about the environment? Uh, it's about space. And, in, and if you take the COVID lens, one of the things that COVID has done is deprived us of freedom. Uh, freedom for children to go out and play in play parks, for example, really important things, but do they have access? And one of the issues in public health has been that of health inequalities. The inequalities in health, uh, more affluent communities, happiness scores are higher in, uh, in more affluent communities. Kids don't get the chance to go out and play in parks as often in poorer communities. Some of that I'm sure you all know. So I was thinking space is important. Social interaction, social networks are important. That's what we've been deprived of through COVID. And, and really important that we have spaces and environments that allow us that interaction. Uh, we need safety and security. How safe and secure uh, are our environments? Uh, and then we need to think about how sustainable. One of the things about COVID has been the fact that uh, the air pollution has got so much uh, 
uh, less. And we've seen it immediately start to go back up again in China, where um, industry has kicked in again. But we need environments that are sustainable. And, and we need sustenance in our environments and we need good and healthy food. And we heard only uh, yesterday and at the end of last week about how COVID is more prevalent in obese populations. Obese populations tend to be poorer, but also within the black and ethnic minority communities. So these are sort of important things. The other two diagrams I've put up there just to connect health and well-being into our environment. So from the Healthy Cities Movement, which you probably may have come across in different ways. The Healthy Cities Movement is a global movement. It's World Health Organization. And you can see the six Ps around it, the six Ps that make up what um, the, the WHO would say was essential for, uh, uh, for a healthy environment would be peace and prosperity, uh, care for our planet, a sense of place, uh, participation and engagement of people. And that's all explained in, in the diagram, which you can't really read as well, but I don't need to go into it in, in any more detail. So a public health approach uh, to happiness and to uh, our environment is one that actually places health at the center, places the individual within their environment and allows them access to the sorts of things that allow them to maximize their opportunity to be healthy. And a lot of what the, the other people, other panelists have been talking about is very much about different aspects of that. And so what I hope I've been able to do in, in this short introduction is to just say, this is the global, the rounded, the overarching picture of what we need to consider when we do the individual uh, initiatives that are going on at the current time. Uh, so I leave that thought with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, I, th I think this was a very beautiful um, uh, image uh, at the end uh, of uh, this round of introductions because it actually brought everything together what uh, we were talking about. Uh, I was actually always wondering why, um, you know, we are talking so much about a vaccine uh, for COVID-19 uh, and we are talking so much about social distancing. Um, if you would calculate it, probably hundreds of millions of dollars in media value. Uh, you have doctors and TV uh, talking about either the one thing or the other thing. Uh, it's a very binary world that we created, where things are only black or white or good or bad. But actually, there's so much nuances. And as we all know, uh, our design for health and happiness could actually... Um, easily enhance through food design, through space design, through relationships design, through social inclusion and so uh, uh, forth, could uh, rise the natural resistance uh, of human bodies uh, to deal with this virus. We know that most of the people don't even have severe conditions. So enough vitamin D production, uh, outdoor activities, uh, everything what, what you also just mentioned and referred to, would be able to uh, increase um, the resistance, less obesity, for example, uh, that you can achieve actually in a few months with a changed diet, uh, uh, would be able to achieve a, a higher immunity within the population yeah. without even having additional costs, because it's just a change of human behavior that is programmed through our culture. So I think we have here a great potential. I wanted to, after we, 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 we asked for the, you know, design for health and happiness, I wanted to uh, now um, paint uh, a dark picture, um, paint a dystopian picture, actually. Uh, I don't know who of you saw the movie Dark City from 1998. It's a very dystopian movie about a city that has no end anymore. So the protagonist of this movie is, um, is there, there's one scene in, 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 in this movie where the protagonist is, um, wants to go back to the place of his childhood. Um, he's going through this dark city that looks like extremely dystopian. Um, uh, there's no nature. The city is always dark. There's always night, even though the inhabitants of the city, the citizens don't realize that they are always uh, living only under artificial light. And then he wants to go back to the Shell Beach where he grew up, where he childhood, uh, his childhood was. And, and indeed in the city, you have everywhere these billboards with Shell Beach announced with a beautiful beach uh, uh, picture on it. And 
he enters a taxi and asks the taxi driver to bring him to this beach. And then the taxi driver is saying, yes, sure, I will bring you there. It's 45 minutes, supposedly. And then he starts to go through the city and they cannot find the way out. What is very interesting. So they cannot find the way out of this dark city into the, into the, uh, the nature, into the beach where, where the ocean basically starts, where we cannot build anymore. And uh, at the end of the movie, you can see that all the world is only city. There's basically nothing left and also nothing from this childhood memories. And if we go back into our own childhood memories, uh, we find these places of total happiness. It's actually my personal, you know, um, experience that this total happiness that I knew as a child, you know, that I can remember as a child is not happening so often in adult life. Probably because adults are more complex, you know, have to deal with much more problems. This kind of, you know, being completely free and light is, is, is not really uh, happening. But if we go back into the childhood, um, to speak also with Pablo Picasso, that was always referring to the child uh, in us, then we can find places that can probably lead us to uh, a city that could be much more healthy and happy. So what I wanted to ask everybody of you, and maybe Maria, uh, if we can come back to you, because you have also this in, in the background, give the joy back. It's ex exactly the, <laughs> it could be basically the motto of my question. How could we create a city that is not for adults, but that is for children, where children can be uh, as happy as we were as children, and maybe then the adult also would be happier. Okay. Well, um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, it there's lots of ways to design um, places with children, and, and one of them is having things at their eye level. You think about very young children, although they do enjoy the space and the ability to be free and to run around. Actually, the way that we're designing cities, most of the time, they're lucky if they see someone's knee. Um, and for a lot of young children, actually, they're not getting to parks. They're not near local green spaces. I mean, one thing about um, the East Bank that's really important for us is the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. And if you go through there, you can see young people, young children enjoying that park and it's a safe space as well. I think that that's the way that we design it is places whereby um, the architecture, the sculpture is designed with children in mind and young people in mind. Um, it's fun, it's a way to learn. Um, and it's spaces where people can sit, have a picnic and feel included. And Jaden mentioned something which I think is really important about actually people's experiences in, in places and spaces are very different in cities. So we have to be kind of careful of romanticizing it. Um, I don't know if anyone knows a piece of work by a guy called Dr. David Williams, and he talks about the issue of weathering. And that's the, just the impact on being the other and been outside in an open space when actually been in the private space is much more comfortable. It's not particularly good for your well-being, but that's not a choice necessarily they make. It's around a choice that society, architects, etc., make. And so I think that's really important when we're talking about health issues and children. It's about allowing people to be who they are and making those places safe as well. I mean, if you ask a lot of people, the reason why they don't go out is A, they think they've got to spend some money with the kids. If you've got a low income, that's expensive. Or actually, B, it's just more comfortable to be at home without the stairs, without the kind of assumptions about who you are. So, you know, we have to think about, especially for children, I think that's really one thing that we have to give back to them, is when we're thinking about places, we look at countering exclusion, just recognizing the politics of place. And so what we have to do is design an inclusion, and that includes age, it includes race, it includes gender, et cetera. So, you know, I think for children, it's making them feel free, enjoy spaces so that they love it, they want to protect it, they become environmentalists, they become urbanists at a very young age. I think that's, that's, that's the most crucial thing, really. And, and I think that's one of the things that we're trying to do and working with um, in East Bank with this new cultural quarter. We're very lucky that we have lots of urban, gray and green spaces with um, good public realm and which you know local communities are using and which we're funding and providing grants to do that so I think that's really important is the way as well that funders and philanthropists support these kind of spaces and ask questions about what they're funding so that when someone asks for money or um, donors uh, a donation towards a piece of work 
the question should always be, how are you disrupting the current space? How are you making it better? And so for the foundation, we've been lucky in, in being able to work with City of London, who have given us a grant to do lots of work around actually bringing in young, young people into the using fusion skills, social skills to actually build their careers and think about potentially innovation architecture and how that's used in the city. Um, and, and more recently with Westfield Stratford City, um, and, and that is about uh, an organization that very much understands public realm and how that can be used for the good, both bricks and mortar, but also spaces around buildings. So I think um, the thing for children is give them a sense of place where they feel they belong, give them a choice, give them the ability to co-design and um, support the adults that they're with too. Thank you very much. Um, Jaden, uh, you were mentioned uh, right now and, and you mentioned also uh, this uh, incident that completely shaked uh, United States and also our world outside, the killing of George Floyd. Um, it was on the 25th. Um, uh, on the 27th, we had a conversation with Hans Ulrich Obrist, uh, where also Tokwasa Dyson participated. And uh, the question to her was, is the city killing us in a way? This is this dystopian mm. vision of a city. And she said uh, she couldn't imagine this situation without the surrounding, without the pavement, the head of uh, George Floyd on this pavement, the knee on his neck, the car, the police car, everything seemed so. She was very intuitively responding to, um, uh, to, 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 to this uh, picture. And she uh, actually painted a picture where everything is interconnected and you cannot imagine it in a different context. And, uh, and the question uh, here is, what would be your childhood memory that could recontextualize something into the better, um, into a better world that could change this uh, dystopian picture into a picture that is, that, that is hopeful? Hmm. Well, 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 first of all, I think, um, we must keep reminding ourselves of that memory, you know, consciously bringing that the murder of George Floyd up, because I think there is power, obviously, in that image, and that image and that moment being ingrained within our collective memory. And if we lose sight of that, we also lose um, an attachment to where we've been and the focus on where we where we need to need to get to. I mean, it's an interesting quote that that you raised. That you couldn't imagine. The, the event, event without the surroundings. But in some ways I couldn't imagine the surroundings without the event. I mean, we want to, want to flip it. And, and we'll just go point. back to this idea of kind of childhood. So childhood and play. I mean, this is, this, is the, this is the sentiment that underpins most of our work where we, um, we look at performance, performance in the city. What role was, was George playing in that, in that performance? What role was the police officer playing? but also in reimagining the different personas that occupy the city um, allows us to disrupt those power structures, allows us to create a new shared experience between us as members. You mentioned, um, and we mentioned a couple of times diversity, but you know, I think diversity comes with tension and struggle and therefore empathy, you know, and joy and new memories and new memories that are in flux. And these, these memories are immaterial in some ways. And, and, I, and I was thinking about them. I was also thinking about education and the play as, a, as education, as an, as an educator also. And I think that's where education comes in, especially arts education. Um, it's the construction of these kind of cultural immaterial memories, these cultural artifacts that underpin the spirit of a place and, and its essence. And these artifacts are often immaterial and they're, they can extend to ideology, revision of ideology that exists in, that manifests itself in the way that we perform. Um, those, those constructions exist as performance, quite overtly, as film and music. And actually, the quote I, 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 I framed earlier about finding the, the, how to make black architecture with the, with the power, beauty, and alienation of black cinema is an extension of Arthur Jafar's kind of um, thesis where he is um, concerned with how to make black cinema with the power, beauty, and alienation of, of black music. But more importantly, these immaterial, uh, these, these immaterial constructions provide the foundation for more material constructions. And I suppose 
to give an, to give an example, um, the murder of George Floyd um, and the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement has led to the destruction and reconstruction of the city's monuments, if one wants to take it in a very literal sense. And um, I think it's about, I think it's about changing that essence in a radical sense. And I also think that by, by moving into that space, I don't think we should disregard the material constructions, but by moving into that space of cultural art artifacts and immaterial constructions, we, we relinquish the, his the stranglehold of historicism that governs our cities, whether that historicism be kind of dominated by men or dominated by uh, the white lens or any, or any other kind of entrenched doctrine that has um, contributed to where we are to, today. I mean, I'm a slightly roundabout, roundabout way of, of answering your question, but I think all of those things are, are intertwined. Yeah, thank you very much. And there's so many uh, thoughts um, that I could imme immediately relate to. I think it's a very beautiful way to see the city as a performance, see the city as a role game that we are playing. And sometimes it becomes really serious, but already children play it less serious, obviously. Uh, and uh, probably we have to start, this is exactly what you said, uh, where it starts um, to be not so serious before it becomes mm -hmm. serious and mm -hmm. uh, to um, influence uh, this also. Sevra, um, I think it's your turn now to <laughs> ask the next oh, question. My, in, my, in the notes that I've been scribbling, um, Jaden has preempted all of the questions around um, <laughs> you know, Actually. interdisciplinarity and interrelationships and education. So I've been sort of striking those off. But I think um, actually those are no, but, all yeah. important points. And I think on the, you know, the very reason that um, we've, we've asked you, all of you here is because of this variety of, of viewpoints. They sort of, um, you know, Sean with your um, background in epidemiology and, um, you know, to Oliver and, and Mac and Caroline and Ken, you know, all these different viewpoints of this sort of intersection and the, the terms that keep coming up are around the, um, around diversity. And of course that has a, a very different meaning in food and in the human microbiome and and then also this this question around education so i think what i'd like to do is just perhaps open it up um sean could i come to you um and then perhaps our other panelists in turn to pick up on on some of the points that that maria raised and then and then Jaden has expanded on around um uh, this theme of of diversity and interrelationships um, and what it means in the context of your work yes well um, my work recently has been very uh, COVID focused. Um, obviously, it's uh, so that's uh, that's really rather dominated, and the, and the whole issue of uh, how diverse groups are impacted by COVID uh, is just a reflection of the disadvantage. Um, I I think that. Uh, the, the work of something like the Healthy Cities movement um, has also played into COVID because where it's one of the precepts that it's founded on is very much on that it, it, local engagement is essential. It, we must listen to the, the co-production and the co-design, all those words we've been hearing today, really important uh, to engage with local communities. And in a way that's also been reflected through the COVID experience. We found that the national approach to designing uh, track and trace. Now, you know, track and trace is an architectural function, but if you look at it, it only works if you do it locally, listen to local people and respond to local people, engage local people. So there are some sort of truths going through this, which even from my lens of, you know, the COVID, the um, epidemiology, the, you know, I'm trying to understand it. We understand things best if we think of our communities and engage our communities and particularly our more deprived communities in, in city areas. So, so I think that, that that's something that seems to me to resonate across. The, the other thing that I, I, I think just that we were all talking about was that whole theme of um, food, diet, choice, obesity, uh, the, and COVID, and, and COVID again, coming in there with um, higher rates where there's diabetes, where there's, uh, where there's more heart disease due to poor diets, due to poor, uh, to uh, lack of choice, due to uh, deprivation, all those issues. COVID has hit worst in those positions. So it is again, that sort of a, just another perspective in, 
public health terms, we talk about inner city deprivation, we talk about the unequalness and the inequity, the need if we are going to create better and healthier societies, we need to do that. We need to focus on how do we provide opportunity and we how do we provide opportunity to young people, to to uh, to children, and, and some of the examples that um, uh, you know, particularly Maria's example, I've been listening and thinking, that's absolutely public health. Uh, what what uh, the project? That's absolutely public health. It's just a different way of looking at it, um, but essential that people understand that and pull that together and see why it's so health generating and hopefully health generating in the future because by focusing on childhood we hopefully lay down the seeds for the future so so for me there's lots of you you wanted to think about the covid lens in cities you think about what covid has done and what it's brought up its lessons are not just about you know a disease a vaccine uh, it's about how we live how we distribute wealth within our societies, how we actually consider those who are less advantaged and what we need to do to actually um, redress that balance. So I, I don't know if that, that, that's just a perspective that's come to me from listening to everybody. Uh, and, and, and you've also helped me make more sense of that sense of place. Uh, it's very popular within local government and um, public health to talk about a sense of place, uh, but a sense of place is, about a beautiful bus stop. I, I love that idea. I, I just, um, and I look forward to seeing more of them, Mac. I think that's really, a, because that's how we're going to engage people by people coming across things and uh, creating things. And so when Oliver talked about biophilia, uh, I have new word for me. I, I'm, I'm very pleased to learn new words, but I think you're talking about some, almost the same things I'm talking about. So uh, I think there's lots of, here, lots of things here about how we translate this down so we all share the perspectives. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, Ken? Yeah, I was just thinking as, as Sean was talking there about this um, sense of place that we've all been describing. And I suppose one of the exciting things, you know, and oddly Zoom can be a place. Uh, and one of the exciting things for me this afternoon is frankly a, a meeting of strangers. So, so people I don't know very well. And this idea that, you know, one of the things that uh, putting this event together and then using this technology allows us to do is to be in these different places and come together and share ideas and find each, each other's notions quite exciting. And I suppose, you know, what I'm really interested in is the physical possibility of doing that. How does one create places where you can safely and excitingly share the company of strangers? Uh, you know, and that's certainly something that has been kind of gradually over the last century or so, if you listen to Richard Sennett, been worked out of the sociology of cities that we're, mm. because we're obsessed with traffic and movement. The idea is, you know, how do we get past strangers as quickly as possible to get onto the, the relationships we really value, which are people we know well. And of course, there's nothing wrong with those relationships. But I suppose, you know, let's think about the reverse engineering process. How can we create places where we come across people we don't know, who have opinions that aren't ours, and who maybe can be an exciting stimulus for us to change, because that's the other thing that's come out for me across so much of what's been said this afternoon is, is not so much the kind of utopia of arriving at uh, ideas that we all buy into, but the gradual movement towards new thinking. And that is where I think, you know, the mixture of the despair and the horror of realizing the world that we've created and the possibility of so much harm and destruction going on. At the moment, I just feel hope because things do feel as though they're changing so kind of creation of space where we can meet strangers and from that a sense in which we can build up a momentum towards new ideas even if the ideal isn't already set and it's very interesting because um you're talking about rituals so you're basically talking about the same topic that Dayton was rising a performance and this is something that i, I in my opinion i don't know several how, how, how you think about it but it's absolutely lacking because uh, before architecture, you have always an architecture of thought. You have also something that is totally immaterial and needs to manifest somehow. So, and the reason why we build things, why we, uh, why we build certain functions into cities is uh, very often a ritual. We all come from backgrounds that are religious, uh, either Catholic, Islam, Judaism. And uh, we lost somehow these rituals, uh, at least not everybody, but in the postmodern society, many. 
And the question is, which rituals really replaced them uh, that allow us to meet people? This is a very good point that you do. And which games, which plays, you know, can we can we have that allow us to come together and really make bonds? And and we uh, we were just you know yesterday talking uh, among friends how important for teenagers the line uh, into the cinema is now when the cinemas are closed because in the line to the cinema they are actually meeting other teenagers this is where they really can meet somebody but how strange is it that we need a line to the cinema to meet other people can't we come up with other ideas that are maybe more natural and also somehow happier and the other example is we had friends over here with with kids uh, they met our kids the very first time they were immediately playing there was not even one second. They could bond immediately. They could play immediately. They jumped basically into the pool and were, were happy because there was a pool, you know? And when we have this kind of engaging infrastructure uh, for adults and for kids, that's probably one of the topics that we haven't looked into so much because we have looked into building office spaces. Trillions of dollars was invested into office spaces. And now we learned that probably we don't need either the office space so much nor the way to the office space in the traffic and the way back from the office space in the traffic. And, and this is something that, uh, Oliver, um, if, if you may elaborate how a biophilic designer would do a city that, that has these functions that we maybe can learn from nature about? Yeah, well, well, actually, I think the idea that I'd like to put forward, I think, relates to a lot of what Caroline's talking about, in that we should think of nature much like we think of a diet and that we, we, we need to consider our access to nature and our nature diet. Um, for many people, the, the main point that they connect with nature is that sort of very carbon intensive holiday that they may take ordinarily at one point in the year, maybe in the summer, uh, maybe less so this year, if you know Spain. Um, but that we need not just, you know, the, the point, this sort of very expensive carbon intensive approach, but actually we need, we need a sort of rich nature diet throughout our lives, but also through our cities. So we need to be finding ways of integrating nature, not just at that kind of focal pinpoint at the top, but also ways of accessing it more than just once a year, but maybe once every six months, maybe monthly, maybe weekly, maybe daily. How do we connect with nature on an hourly basis? You know, maybe it's just a plant on your desk. So this idea of a nature diet is both uh, about how we connect with nature as a means to reduce stress, to aid recuperation, to put us in a better physical space, uh, a mental state to connect with the people around us. Um, it's also about how we physically in introduce it into the city through um, a variety of green and blue features, whether that's uh, the bigger sort of national parks that we have in a country, or, or whether it's the kind of the green routes into our city, maybe it's the pocket parks, the likes that Mac are creating so beautifully. Maybe it's about how we create those green spaces in the perimeter or facades of buildings, but also how we bring it right into our everyday experiences. Because, you know, in reality, we spend 90% of our lives indoors. Now, I think one of the issues that COVID-19 has brought about is the social inequality uh, associated with our access to nature. And there was an interesting report that has just been launched in uh, June of 2020, written by the RSPB, called Recovering Together Report. And what it does is it shines a light onto the social inequality and in access to nature and green spaces. So one of the statistics they have in it is that people in the UK with an annual income of under £10,000 is 3.6 times more likely to have no outdoor space where they live. In addition, just 34% of people in households without any outdoor space reported being within a 10 minute walk of publicly accessible, publicly accessible nature. So clearly we need to be thinking about our cities and, and it's more than just a luxury to be near a park. It, it, I believe it's an essential feature of how we create happier and healthier places and cities to live in. Yeah, totally. Carolyn, you are... Thumbs up because you know that nature goes through our mouth, right? And so we are actually, as yeah. you said, we have to eat nature yeah. to, because we are nature. That's yeah. maybe the, the most important thing. We, we forget about it, but uh, we, um, we, we are nature that needs uh, the other parts of nature to survive. Exactly. I mean, I would echo everything Oliver just said. In fact, I'm proposing something very similar. I call it 
Ma it sounds really boring, maximizing the urban rural interface. But, but, but basically um, in my work, I mean, I'm very interested in the sort of inherent duality that we face. Uh, and I like to use Aristotle's term, um, political animals. So he calls us, uh, he uses this term and it's, it's, it expresses if beautifully the dilemma that we face when we're trying to work out how to create what I call a landscape for human flourishing which is that on the one hand, we're political, which means we need, as Ken very eloquently said, you know, we need places where we can come together and meet other people and be more than the sum of our parts. We need, need sociability. This is why we live in cities. But on the other hand, we need nature because we're animals. Um, and if you look in history, um, you know, rich people have always bought themselves both. So rich people have always had a place in the town and a place in the country. Why? Because we need both, you know, but of course, as we know, most people can't afford two houses, let alone one these days. So very much, I mean, exactly as Oliver was just describing, I'm sort of asking the question, how do we create a landscape where, you know, the, the majority of people have access to both? And of course, it can happen at any scale. So it can be about the relationship between a city and its region, or it can be about, you know, parks within the city, or it can be designed at a much more macro level. So basically designing, you know, housing with big balconies or places you can sort of, you know, communal gardens and so on. And I think it's very important to say that it's, it's this is something that you can post fit as well as design in the future. So, and it's not just about, by the way, sort of, as it were, post fitting nature into cities. It's also about asking what, what the, our relationship with the countryside and with nature is because I mean, again, there's a very strong sort of um, mindset that sounds a bit like your dark city example, Nikolai, where, you know, basically the argument is we all have to move into cities and pull up the drawbridge. And I'm actually saying, no, well, we need access to nature. So we need to find ways of co-dwelling with, with wildness, if you like, which of course then has a massive implication for how we produce our food. Um, I mean, they're all interrelated questions, but, but you know, in the end, it's about recognizing that there is, there's a paradox. I call it the urban paradox that we describe ourselves as living in cities, but actually in a more profound way, we still dwell in nature. And as you just said, we are of nature, you know? I mean, we're literally made, literally every atom in our bodies is made from the food we've eaten over the years, you know, and the air we've breathed. So we are literally constructed out of a landscape um, and I think if we remember that and remember that we cohabit with non-humans as well as other humans, very important point, then, you know, we can sort of rethink, as I say, not just the question of what, how to design cities, but cities as part of a bigger whole, which is the natural world. And again, as I say, the formulation I've come up with is asking what the a landscape for human flourishing looks like, which to me, already by implication, includes non-humans, because humans can't flourish without non-humans. So it's, uh, and of course, it's about diversity and complexity, both in the natural world and in the human world. Yeah, but it's interesting that you mentioned Aristoteles because Aristoteles was, you know, later only Thomas Aquinas was referring very much to him, but this was the, the holistic worldview where we all belong together to Mother Earth, actually. Uh, and then the enlightenment took us very uh, further uh, apart from our own bodies into this kind of mind uh, organism that we seem to be right now yes. where we created everything and white industrialization here plays also uh this is what Torquasa dyson mentioned white male probably industrialization it achieved a lot but also uh disconnected us actually completely from this idea of uh, i don't know if you all are familiar with james lovelock that is now um, uh, celebrating his 101st birthday. This is a great science system from UK. And he came up with this theory of Gaia, where basically uh, preparing back then the NASA mission, the first NASA mission to Mars, he looked back at Earth, thinking about how a planet like Mars could be made livable. And then he realized that probably this planet altogether is describable as an organism itself. and. Uh, that kind of theory would basically mean that uh, that we are not designing, we are basically only transforming already existing places into something completely else. This is exactly what Maria mentioned uh, in her first statement, that we always have to see 
what uh, what we are transforming from what into what. But but the practical solutions how to implement this, uh, several we were talking before about it. Uh, I think Mark here uh, with the edible bus stop is basically connecting both. Uh, she is creating a space. She is creating a environment that is you know feelable, touchable. But it's also bringing us back to something very um, uh, primary that uh, things that we see are also things that we can eat that we are able to connect with them uh, from a perspective of the totality of our body and our existence. And it's very interesting, um, Mark, how you brought this into life in a city. And I would be extremely interested to know how this works, how this project is financed, how it because in this well-being culture forum, we actually want to bring you together to learn from you. So everything what you said was already recorded and will be recorded. And we want to follow up on, on your projects and see how we can maybe support them, how we can learn also from each other and how we can bring them into, into real life. So Mark, that would be for me extremely interesting uh, if you could share how this project is working. Well, um, we have uh, our clients are either local authorities or corporate clients. Uh, we'll work with festivals to create planted sculptural installations. So, well, I, 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 with the Pocket Park, I personally went and found that funding myself because it was available at that time. Um, but there is there there's various sources of funding or were. We'll see what's going to happen with that now. Uh, what I feel is. The, the reason why it's so inspiring is the, the, the transformation that happens, this brutal to beautiful thing. And it's something that we can all really relate to. And what, the, what COVID and the, this, the, the very heavy handed lockdown we, we had in April and May, what really, really became very clear is how vitally important our green spaces are in the public realm. I mean, desperately important and that uh, we need, as Oliver mentioned, there's this distance standard. Uh, you need to be within nine minutes or 400 metres, according to your mobility, of an accessible and inclusive green space. And, and this is this third space, you know, so your first space is your home, your second space is your office, and the third space is the park, the barber, you know, this space that we share as a community. And green spaces are all the more important and more powerful. How you go about actually doing the same is that you've got, well, if you, your neighborhood has a, has a site that could do with beautifying, um, you've got to start by listening to the, the rest of the neighborhood. So that didn't happen. The, the original edible bus stop did not happen without me personally fly, flying about a thousand leaflets through local doors and, and meeting people and talking with them. And that's what I still do now is in my business is, there is very, nothing happens without a conversation with the community. There's a lot of talk about community building, which I find slightly unsettling because the community are already there. What needs building is the cradle for them to develop and foster their relationships and to be able to have a discourse and be able to have that communication. So therefore I have witnessed, you know, the granny coming along with some winter greens and telling the, the middle class man who I happen to know used to work with Sotheby's, you grow these, you've got greens all winter long. And there was this sort of complete turning of the tables of power, whereas he was the one who was the high earner. There she was teaching him how to grow food now. And this is why, again, I, you know, I always return to the edible element because it's something that we can all relate to. So as for encouraging it, it it's it's harder nowadays obviously there's less and less funding and something that I I often have a, a struggle with um, with uh, local authority funding is nobody wants to pay for maintenance now if you're planting things these are yeah. live living things you know <laughs> you're going to need some ongoing maintenance so that they're, you're just you're just gonna have to be pretty smart about it and I, I just say to everyone just do it just dig it just get on with it and don't worry don't ask for permission ask for forgiveness <laughs> Well said. Um, I think we're we're very nearly out of time, and I'm going to hand back to you momentarily, Nikolai, for um, to invite the panelists to do closing remarks. But I think just um, to ensure that we're not ignoring our audience, um, we've had an audience question come in, so I'm going to to read that and invite some of our panelists to respond. Um, 
So this is from uh, Sagar Sumaria. Hi, Sagar, if you're listening. Um, if architecture is to be inclusive, then we need to embrace all ethnic minorities in the field. How do you propose that we are fully inclusive of all ethnic groups? I think this means in architecture and by doing so get inspiration, not only from different cultures, but from the different sort of ways of building and architecture as well. Um, could I invite one or more of you to respond to that? Uh, I have a, an answer from someone that used to want to be an architect. Um, I used to go to the library regularly, the local library when we all had them, and um, look at architecture books. And I can remember thinking, I'm not going to be an architect because of how long it takes. Mm -hmm. um, but not just that, the cost of taking a really long course. And so I think the cost, the years and investment in that actually excludes a lot of people. If you don't have the money, if you think that you need to kind of pay for 10 years or five years worth of, of qualifications, that's, that's going to be difficult for a lot of people. And actually, you know, been quite often working with architects and planners, some really good ones. I think it's only now that the architectural field is, is looking at itself about who it's, who it's bringing in, which doors it's closing, not necessarily on purpose, but just through the structure, the, the kind of way in which you have to pay, spend a lot of time. Um, but also the way that, that architects can design, they can design out. Most of them are very good and don't. But I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult. It has been, from the people that I know of colour, have been very difficult to get into architecture and planning. Uh, what I like about the sectors now is that they're putting their hands up to that and looking at how they might do it. But there's organisations um, like uh, the Black Female Architects and various others now, and I think it's worth people having conversations um, with individuals already in the sector who want to get into the sector. I think Jaden was also raising his hand. Sure, if that's all, if that's all right to, to jump in and, and maybe I can, and, can answer that question, but also tie a thread between some of the other comments that have been said, because I think they're, I think they're all really engaged and I just want to thank you for putting on this talk because it's so nice to be in, in, that, in this space together. I mean, there's, there is this thread of conversations, com Mac mentioned conversations with community, and I've mentioned architecture speaking to and speaking of the un underrepresented. But I also think that architecture needs to speak to power. We've talked about power dynamics, et cetera. And today we've expanded the conversation to include more than buildings. This is really nice to hear, right? And I think we should challenge that dogma um, to, to include more than the constructed material objects don't think we should relinquish this ground. I think this ground is really important ground to occupy because this is the ground in which we speak to power. And to, and to kind of go back to what Ken said, Ken said, what are the physical possibilities? And that was framed in the sense of constructing a space in which people can, the strangers can meet other strangers. And, and Nikolai, you talk about kind of opinions we don't know, but I think it's about the broadcast of different narratives, the broadcast of different experiences and and then i want and then i wanted to just make that connection between kind of the broadcast of rituals you know and it had me thinking about the lack of material ritual culture that exists within black communities um whereas if we consider architecture we've talked about arch architecture as um, or food or we we're composed of what we eat etc but Architecture is the manipulation of nature also, and it is the manipulation of nature through our hands, which is constructed um, out of the landscape. And if you talk about, and how do we maximize the urban rural inter interface? And so if we're talking about the material culture of architecture, then we must address slavery and how people of color through the slave trade were brutally disconnected from millennia of material culture. How, how, do we, how do we construct an environment in, the, in which people who don't feel like, and they don't have the capacity or um, do have the capacity or not afforded the opportunities to rediscover a material culture, to rediscover an architecture, which is expressive of them and expressive of those communities um, who are underrepresented and therefore express through their comp composition uh, the different rituals that that we talk about, and that's what, and that's what, and that's where I think, um, well, at, at least our, our practice is situated at the moment. How to create that kind of genuine material expression 
and again the relationship between the material compositions which um, people of colour are so good at, at doing. Thank you very much. Um, somebody else? Or should I ask a wrap-up question for everybody? Oh yeah, Caroline, please. Well, I'd just like to pick up on the question of ritual, which, which you mentioned earlier. And of course, you know, the, the, the one ritual that all of us still take part in every day, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? It's, it's, it's eating, sharing food, um, you know, and I, this is why I genuinely believe, I mean, I, I, it's, and I'm just going to do the first summing up because I seem to be speaking now, but I mean, you know, it seems to me that food is just the low hanging fruit, um, not just in terms of plucking it off a tree, but also just in terms of being the thing that we naturally still know how to share food really well. And I often compare sharing food to sharing money. You know, if you imagine sitting around a table with all, you know, friends and strangers, this is, I mean, it's Ken's space of getting together. It's the space we've been talking about of diversity, but also nobody leans forward and says, right, I'm going to have all this food for myself. Thanks very much. But that's precisely what we do with money, which is why I think we have to reinvest the value of our economies and our societies in food, uh, in something that's real and where, that we know how to share. And, you know, I mean, I just, I, I think, you know, there's been so many amazing common threads through all the speakers today. And I just want to say, you know, <laughs> I've really enjoyed the conversation. I, I think we're all saying the same thing in different ways, frankly. And it is about coming up with a new idea of a good life, um, which I also believe we can do through the lens of food, uh, a good life that's not just about consuming, but that's about sharing and is about the things that make us happy that don't even show up on the GDP register, which is about caring for your neighbor, feeling like you belong, having access to opportunity and showing and feeling love. Um, and, you know, I think all the speakers today, that's really what lies at the heart of their work. And, uh, you know, it's just been great to hear so many amazing projects and views. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, uh, that's a very beautiful uh, statement, but I have to ask, to you, uh, anyways, my, my question, because I would like everybody of you to give one sentence. If you could decide about one sentence in a global urban manifesto, what would be for you the most important sentence that you, you would like to put into this manifesto? And then can, uh, after this, uh, uh, it's, it's your turn. <laughs> Caroline, if you... I, I, for me, it would be, um, we need to construct a society in which everybody eats well. And, and, and everything is in that because eating well means the food has to be good and it has to be created from a landscape that wasn't despoiled with no slavery involved as Jaden mentioned, you know, with no cruelty to animals and you can't eat well if anybody else is going hungry. So it, everything comes from this. That's my image of a good society. Thank you so much. Ken? Yeah, I think one other common theme that's just carried on bubbling up for me during the afternoon is, um, you know, which links to my excitement about being in cities is the opportunity to learn. Uh, you know, so I, every single one of you has taught me two or three things this afternoon. And there's kind of, you know, what you've fantastically done th through this project is, is create a little virtual city here. Uh, and I, I do think that the opportunity to find things out. I mean, I work in partly in a university and, and I believe in, in value of just the excitement of finding out new ideas and working out what they mean to you um so yeah so uh thanks to all of those involved with uh, with creating this afternoon's opportunity to, to learn uh, and kind of modeling some of the best things that can happen in cities where you come across exciting people with different ideas and you just pause and listen and think uh and uh yeah dwell on the opportunity to learn i guess is my sentence Thank you so much. Who's next? Maria, do you have a uh, sentence that you would like to see in yeah, the program I, manifesto? I, I think, I think the, the sentence was be, it would be, don't be afraid to invest. So that's government into um, well-being cities, but, but also philanthropists. You know, actually philanthropists have a big role and always have had, um, and let's, let's see that again. And um, part of my sentence would be, um, let's build in relationships, equitable environments, design where it's built at human scale and public realm, which is not lost just to private ownership. 
Super, thank you. Um, I think I could jump in straight there because I feel very strongly about the public realm staying in public ownership. Um, so I think I want to take it, bring it right back to the children. And I say, I want it on the curriculum. I want children to be taught to feel that they too could be designing their spaces around them, their public realm, that they could, they could be taught to, to, that, they, that they have the possibility of being designers, of being creators, and that they could be taught to appreciate green spaces. There should be gardening on the curriculum. There should be cooking food on the curriculum. So they understand right from a very young age, the vital importance of those, those things. And that, that, that these, and that this would then translate to them as adults, creating beautiful, biodiverse, accessible and inclusive green spaces that are welcoming to all. And, that, and then in that, we can all start having more conversations with each other, breaking down the uh, barriers and finding our commonalities. Perfect. That's already almost a full manifesto, but that's, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no, but it's very good. I mean, it's uh, you're not restricted at all. Shan, I, I was just thinking. I mean, a very short one would be uh, uh, to make sure that uh, all children have space to play, uh, because I think that has some ramifications. But I also think we need to create an environment that places health and well-being at its centre. Uh, and listen to what local people feel health and well-being is. Well, yeah, I think that's I a very good further. one. I leave it to people to decide what that is. Thank you so much. Oliver. I would totally agree. I mean, I think the city of the future needs to take both a carbon centric approach and not just look to minimize its impact on the environment, but seek to be regenerative regenerative towards the wider natural environment, but also from a more human centered approach to the health and well-being of the people that live in it. To see that bringing nature in to the city is not just a nice to have luxury that's the preserve of the wealthy, but that it's got to be integrated holistically throughout the city in order to deliver um, the enormous benefits for the wider population. Yeah, thank you so much. Dayden. What is your take on a manifesto for the? Utopian I think for, for for I think for a healthy and happy city, we must consider the roles we play, and embrace the conflicting stories of rapture, agony, wonder, revelry, effort, uh, tension, struggle, and joy, because it's about empathy in both our cultural artifacts and the constructed objects of the world. Super, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you so much. This is a beautiful end sentence that uh, we will include um, in the documentation of this forum. I want to thank uh, Severa, you so much for co-moderating and organizing uh, this forum. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dizine uh, for airing it live. And uh, I want to thank the British Council our team uh, from Terma Art, and then I want to thank everybody of you who have joined this forum. Um, for me, this is just the beginning of our relationship, so I really hope that while entering now the UK market, we will have a lot of possibilities to uh, create stronger bonds with each other because we really uh, admire your work and we think that it's absolutely necessary the work that you're doing and we want to support it. We want to be a part of it and we want to exchange with you uh, information and best practice solutions. And uh, we want to work towards exactly this motto, the future together. And yeah, thank you very much. And I wish uh, also thank you to our viewers. Yeah, thank you again for being so many. And uh, we will uh, see you all soon. Uh, please check our website, Tama. Dot art, uh, where we announce the next Wellbeing Culture Forums. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.